Hi, Nancy. Hi there. What's going on? It's early morning here. Where are you? I'm in uh, Kansas City, Missouri. So is that Eastern time or? It, uh, it's Central. So I'm at 9 a.m. Where are you oh. at? I'm in Aspen. It's it's not that bad. It's 8 o'clock. Okay. Yeah. I've, I've had worse. Right. We all have, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, but when I look back, I'm like, why did I say I would do eight o'clock in the morning? You know, it's like, I got to get up. I got to like look normal. You right. know? No, I get it. I 100% get it. It's different but, for you. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, no, I, you just get up and go. I've em I've embraced mornings. You know, I there was a time where I didn't, but I, I tend to, once I got yeah. into fatherhood and domestication, it, it all got easier. So. It all happens. Yeah. No, I actually do clients at 730 in the morning is my first client because then I don't work from nine till two yeah right yeah i'm out i'm out playing yeah every day and so i like a 7 30 because it cuts off um but it's not being video so yeah right well, that's the other part of it too um so but it, hey it's great to meet you and you know before we get into your life as a coach and an author you know we went through quite a thing with covid we're entering the post-pandemic period how did you get through that time period and how has it changed the way that you do things now? You want me to tell you or you want to do that then? I, I'm happy to tell you. Um, it was, COVID actually was good for me. Right. Because my book was being launched right when COVID hit. And so my book, my whole book tour didn't happen. And I could either sit there and say, like, how the hell did this happen to me? I've been, yeah. this book's been in the progress for two years, right? Um, or I could pivot and say, how, how can I make this work for me? And I ended up, my book launch was on Zoom. I had over 200 people. And I can tell you, if I had had a book at the stores, gone to a couple of stores, I would have gotten like 15 or 20 people. You don't really... Yeah. So I'm not that I'm not like this big famous person that everybody's going to rally around. And so I was able to cultivate like I had other writers and other coaches on and I and then they all brought their people. I ended up with like 200 people and my book became an international bestseller. I got on extra TV because it was like, how do you manage covid? How do you pivot? You know, how do you put your fears where they belong instead of letting your fears run you? How do you, you know, use fear as a driving force for change? And how do you do that with your children? And what do you tell your children? And what do you need to let go of? How do you let go of attachment? All of those things are what I teach anyway. Sure. Ovid just made it. And because I work from home, it and I have a partner and a dog, it's like it didn't change my life that much. And I didn't I still went and saw my kids. I didn't stop seeing them. So, you know, it, sh it it quieted our life, but I still got outside in nature every single day. Yeah. Yeah, I would imagine being up in Aspen too. You know, that's the thing I think about COVID, just like you said, the silver lining. You got more people and then probably in your capacity as a coach, people did a lot of introspection. People are looking to really kind of figure some things out on a deeper level. Yeah. Because COVID brought out what wasn't working everywhere. Yeah, certainly did. So let's find out exactly what you do on a daily basis for a living. What I'm going to do is put you in front of a bunch of third grade students at career day. One of the kids looks up and says, hey, what do you do for a living? How do you answer that child? I help people figure out how, they, how they're going to move forward in their life. I help them get out of their fear learn to be bigger, better, braver, try things that they don't care if they're good at, but that they want to try. And um, and when they're sad or they don't feel well, I help them figure out why are they sad and why they don't feel well and how they can change their life. So you're clearly in a capacity to help people. It's not just a job. You're doing something much more. Oh, Let's yeah. Let's go back to the beginnings of your life. Where were you born and raised? And how were these seeds put into you to want to help other people out there in the world? You know, I had a really great childhood, but I can't really say, well, I definitely was brought up with the shadow belief that love and life means putting everyone in front of you. So that makes you a people pleaser and a conflict avoider. And so it has its pros and cons. 
basically it does shut you down and it doesn't make your needs a priority, but it also makes you other thinking about other people. But um, I only can look back at my life now and see that like I got a BA in psychology and sociology and I got a master's in education. And then I owned a personal gym for 16 years and I helped people from the outside in. And then my own life fell apart more than once. And I learned to work on myself from the inside out. And then it was an easy shift to want to do that for other people. So as somebody that inspires others, who's been an inspiration or a hero for you? Well, growing up, actually, I always thought my mother was like this big, powerful woman. Um, but at the end of the day, like she didn't really, she taught piano, she didn't work. She didn't go further than she could have, but she definitely instilled in her three daughters that they could do anything and be anything. And I always felt her love and support and my dad's, but I was definitely more in with my mom. Um, and I would say that my all of my mentors, Debbie Ford, Nancy Levin, Kelly Casau, now Terry Real, all of the um, mentors who have trained me are who I emulate, you know, and that doesn't necessarily mean I emulate like how they're living their life or, you know, I, I guess what I got from my mother was to live my life in integrity and to honor what I say I'm going to do and follow through. That definitely came from my mother. She had an, and my father, an amazing worth ethic, um, ethic, ethic, yeah, work ethic and ability to plow through and do and be and blah, blah, blah. So if you could meet anybody on the planet right now, who would it uh, be? Who would you love to meet and talk to? That might be mutually beneficial for honestly, what you do. It would be Terry Real, who's, who is who I'm getting certified now for my marriage and relationship coaching. I think he's phenomenal. I definitely am like a part of his cult, if, you know, for lack of a better word. And so to actually be able to sit and be with him and learn from him directly would be a great gift for me. So as a coach, you know, you're close to this world of helping people find what they need to fix and to get to a better place. What's a very common thread in this post-pandemic era of our little human march down here? What are you seeing that people aren't seeing for themselves that is relatively easy for you to see, but probably complex to like fix for people? I, people are not aware of what's in their subconscious. I mean, it's in their subconscious. They also aren't aware that what's in their subconscious rules their operating system. So it's not in their conscious mind, but their inner child, their wounded child, their adaptive child, all of the parts of them inside, they know that you're getting what you're most committed to and you don't know what that is. So people go through life saying, I want this, but what I'm experiencing is this. I, I want an, I want to leave my job and be an entrepreneur, but what I'm experiencing is staying in the job because I'm more committed to safety or I'm more committed to making the money that I know I'm gonna make, or I'm more committed to not changing, to being afraid of change. So that's what's in your subconscious, the belief that you're not good enough or you know, you'll, never, you'll never succeed or you need to stay quiet to be safe or you're broken or your needs don't matter. All these subconscious beliefs are actually what rule you and people aren't aware of them. And I help them uncover those beliefs and then they can, it changes their whole life. So every day you get up, you have a motivation to do the work that you do. What is that motivator? What is the, the flame on the torch, so to speak, that makes you help people and to strive as a professional? I'm passionate about how this work works. And um Financially, the work doesn't support me, so I don't need to work. I work because I love to work, and I love the way it makes me feel, and I love helping others. So it it, it feeds me. You know, I love being a coach. I love being an author. I love helping people, and I love the identity that I've developed in this work, and I love being in this conversation with so many people 
a coaching conversation is my favorite conversation. So what has been one of the best success stories you've been involved with? One that consistently puts a smile on your face. Of my clients? Yeah. I had a, I had a guy that I knew. Uh, we were in a bike group together. Nicest guy. Very successful. But for like two years, he was so sad. And I finally biked up to him one day and I said, you know, you just seem so sad. How much longer do you want to be that way? And I said, I think you should coach with me. I think I can really help you get out of this. And not only did I help him get out of it and un uncover why he thought it was his marriage, but really he was in a job he no longer wanted. He was making a lot of money. He had a belief that he had to make his parents proud. At this point, he's in his 60s. His parents are proud, right? So he was able to recognize that it wasn't his wife. It was him. And his happiness was from within and help him get his ducks in a row, leave his job. And within two weeks, he had like four consulting gigs that were making probably three times what he was making. And he thought I was a rock star. He's like my, he, he, I can get a testimonial from him that shines. He just thinks I changed his life. And so that's what I do. And I would say I've had a lot of successes, but he stands out. So let's go back to that first question and kind of piggyback off of it. When you were in the third grade, what was your dream to grow up to become? What did you want to be? I was going to be a teacher. Yeah. Normal girl can be a mommy and a teacher at the same time. Absolutely. So let's say you have a dream tonight. You run into the 20-year-old version of yourself, and you could give that younger version of you a piece of advice based on the life you've lived, the wisdom you've gained. What would you tell that young version? That my divorce was not going to be the worst thing in the world and to handle it differently. Would your young version listen? Well, she was so in love with her husband, my husband, at that, you know, um, would she have listened? Probably not. I think yeah. you have to live the life you're living and learn the lessons as they go along. So probably not. So as a as a writer, what was the first book you read when you were younger that either made you want to read more or write yourself? Well, first of all, I want to say I'm not really a writer. I'm an author. Gotcha. So, so I'm not, there aren't books waiting to come out of me. Yeah. I This was a self-help coaching book for people who really want to start with a book versus hiring a coach or can't afford a coach. Um, but my favorite book as a child really was Casey, the Wonder Horse. And it was about a horse in pajamas that talked, but he only talked to his boy. And his boy called him a horse. He called him a boy. And it was just a funny, loving story that I have recently read to my grandchildren. That's wonderful. So everyone out there sees you in a certain light. You, Your family, your friends, your clients, your colleagues. Uh, those that get your book, but you ultimately lead the charge. What's your perception of you? Who do you think you are? Um, I think I'm a woman who lives in integrity and does what she says she's going to do. I can be a powerhouse. Um, I could be an ever ready battery, you know, bunny. I'm a great grandmother and a great mother. And hopefully a great partner and a great friend. So I'm also can be judgmental and not have enough patience, things I'm working on, both of those. I've come a long way. And um, I say what's on my mind. So that can be great or that could be hard for some people. So I think that's what makes me a great coach is that I am very compassionate and empathetic and hold the space for people to do their own work and find their own answers. And I encourage them and I can be their accountability partner and a cheerleader, but I also call them on their shit all the time. I, I take, you know, I don't allow for excuses. If you want to work with me, you, you have to live in an excuse-free zone or it's not going to be a good fix. I can only work as hard as they're working. Yeah.
So I like to work with people who really want to change. So if anyone wants to hire you, get your book, learn more about you, anything pertaining to your world, where is the best place to go? Well, my website, Nancy Picard Life Coach, um, has it all. So I'm on social media. I'm on Nancy Picard Life Coach on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. I do a free call for anybody who wants it. You can get that free call link right on my website. You can get my book on my website. You can get my book on Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Um, I'm really accessible. Excellent. Sounds like you have an East Coast accent. Well, I, I grew up in Buffalo. Okay. I, I raised my kids in New Jersey. And now I live in Aspen and a couple of months in California each year. Good for you. This has been great, Nancy. Thank you for opening up. Thanks for your story. Best of luck with everything. Thank you. Take care.